wild places, rivers, trees, animals. Can we live without them? Probably not. It doesn't matter if you live in the country or the big city. Our lives depend on the things wild places provide. Fresh water, oxygen to breathe, protection from natural disasters, and important lessons in science, survival, invention, art, innovation. Nature is a great teacher, but wild places are not wild without healthy ecosystems. What if we could preserve wild places simply by protecting one family of animals, bears? Bears are found on roughly one third of the Earth's land surface. There are eight species of bears. From the Arctic to Peru to China to Borneo to Alaska, this is bear country. Bears are ambassadors for wild places. And according to scientists, they are pretty well qualified for the job they have held for over five million years. Bears are keystone species. Like farmers in the wild, they disperse seeds, till the land, fertilize forests. Bears are indicator species. Healthy bear populations tell us fish are thriving, forests are healthy, and the ecosystem is balanced. Bears are umbrella species. Bears have some surprising neighbors, thousands of species that live alongside them in bear country. Protect bears and everything else is healthy. This was bear country. This is bear country. This is you. And what they need, we need. Because we're all in this together. Our future relies on these wild places. What can you do? Go on your own journey. Learn everything you can. Discover those working to protect bears, their ecosystems, and the wild spaces they inhabit. Join them. Support them. Tell others. Because what's good for bears is good for people and the planet. So there's about eight species and four genera of bear all over the world. For our purposes, uh, we're going to be going over bears here in North America. There's three main species that you're going to see in North America, and the most common is the American black bear. It is also the most timid and the least dangerous. Um, some subspecies of conservation concerns are the Louisiana black bear, which exists over on the Texas-Louisiana border. They live in bottomland swamps over there. Um, a lot of habitat loss and degradation has caused them to essentially go away. Um, the other species is the grizzly and brown bear. Um, these are essentially the same thing. Uh, grizzly bears usually refer to the bears that are more inland, whereas the brown bears are going to be in the more coastal regions. Um, some people delineate it based on their diet, so those that have access to marine food are going to be brown bears versus, you know, say Montana, they're going to be grizzlies. Um, the most common places to see these in North America are Montana, Yellowstone National Park area, Utah, and Washington. These are much more aggressive than black bears. Um, there's some subspecies that are important, uh, Kodiak bears, which only live on the Kodiak Island, uh, the California grizzly, and there's the Mexican grizzly bear as well. And then lastly, and probably the least common that we'll ever run into is the polar bear. Um, you're gonna see these in Alaska, North Canada, um, around the Arctic Circle. Uh, these are the most dangerous, and some people think it's because of a lack of human interaction, so they don't know that they should be afraid of humans and can potentially see humans as a prey item. Um, these are vulnerable. Um, global warming is a big deal, obviously, and they have been known to hybridize with grizzlies 
and some people call them growler bears or pizzly bears so I guess that vernacular is up to you. So the distribution of American black bears you can see that very extensive in Canada you got them all the way in the west coast the Rocky Mountains the east coast and down into even the deserts of Mexico and then we have the grizzly bears and this is this the browner color whereas the black bears is this gray dark gray and they're going to be North Canada into Alaska as well as got a couple pockets here and then lastly are the polar bears and you can see that this is the white on the map here so obviously very north Arctic Circle interestingly is the historic black bear distribution and you can see that basically every state in America was occupied with black bears this was from a publication back in 1981 and then you can see here the 1995 range which was predicted for some studies done in 1994 so although black bears aren't necessarily endangered um, we have definitely pushed them out of our way a little bit so I feel like that map was pretty striking so here's a simple figure I made to try to give you a little bit of a rough outline of what happens in a in a year for a bear so we'll start in January or February um, while they're hibernating um, if they were pregnant before hibernating then they'll actually have their offspring while they're sleeping and they'll wake up to some cute little cubs there in the den with them come early March April they're gonna emerge from their dens and then come summer um, if they haven't mated yet they're gonna try to mate or if they're raising offspring then they'll just continue to raise their cubs and they'll continue to seek forage and food and uh, basically fatten up and so then the hibernation period kind of starts and depending on northern or southern latitudes um, they'll go into their dens anywhere between September and December and the uh, cycle starts all over so what do bears eat um, this is kind of the beginning of the myths and misconceptions part and for our purposes because black bears are far more common in America than grizzly bears we're gonna focus a little bit more on that for this presentation but one of the myths you know of bears being these giant meat-eating you know carnivore predators um, isn't necessarily true at least for black bears uh, most of their diet so around 90 percent or more is going to be entirely plant material in early spring they're looking for flower parts, um, aspen, uh, maple stems, grasses, any of that good green stuff to try to get that metabolism flowing again. In the fall acorns and nuts are, are growing and uh, dropping from the trees, oak seedlings, pine nuts, and then berries are critically important. So this is a good source of sugar for energy and so we've got blueberries, dogwood berries, June berries. These are pretty common up north. And then up north as well, we've got hazelnuts, and this is one of the most preferred foods for bears, for black bears at least. And then surprisingly, is they have this massive animal eating very small animals. So um, less than 10% of their diet is from animal protein, but a large of that that a large part of that percentage is ants. They have this really long, sticky tongue, and it's really great for probing into ant colonies. And then where available, they'll try to get fish. Uh, such as salmon and stuff like that up north as well as grubs and caterpillars and various other insects so what are some problems um, I think one of the biggest problems is habituation and this is when a bear essentially comes into contact with food left by humans and they discover that uh, humans and coolers and all these things are a potential food source and this is dangerous for people obviously because once a bear recognizes that red cooler means food it will continuously go after those coolers when it sees them uh, once a bear is habituated the behavior is difficult if not impossible to change and so when these when this happens many of these habituated slash problem bears are killed outright or they're transferred to a new location so what are some solutions? Um, some of the easiest ones that we can do as outdoors men and women and recreators is uh, there's bear proof containers for food when you're hiking and I'm pretty sure we've all seen the bear proof trash cans 
Um, keep your coolers stored safely away in your vehicle. Don't leave coolers out every night. Um, some advice I've heard is to cook in a separate area from where you're living. So I forget the rule of thumb for how many feet, but basically as far as you can away from where you're going to be sleeping, cook food there. And there's also these things called bear bags, uh, which you can hang food from trees or tall poles that prevents the bear from uh, getting into it. And this also works for um, deodorant and toothpaste. Anything with a strong scent has shown to attract bear, so it's not just food. And so keep that in mind. So now we'll get into some of the common myths and misconceptions. Uh, one is that bears are unpredictable, that they're uh, ravenous predators on the landscape, and that's simply not true. Bears use extensive body language and vocalizations to show intent. Um, if they are angry, they will snort, they'll do these things called false charges. Um, they huff, they puff, and they grunt to show happiness or basically to tell you to get out of my space. Another one is that bears are ferocious, and this is similar to the unpredictable. Um, now, I'm not trying to say that you should not be afraid of bears. I think a healthy fear uh, and keeping a healthy distance is, is the key to all of this, but I'm trying to alleviate you know, if anyone has this deep-seated fear, like, oh, I don't want to go out the, to the back country because of bears. Um, so they do have the potential to do major harm, and they have. But um, black bears especially are usually very shy and very timid, and the last thing they want to do is interact with us. Just like us humans, they have a critical space, and I believe most of the problems um, boil down to invading this space. And when you do that, you're forcing a reaction of either fight or flight. If the fight happens, um, you're at a severe disadvantage, unfortunately. So a lot of this is just common sense and uh, not being that tourist who is trying to get up close and take a picture of that bear. So then mother bears are likely to attack. Not true, at least for black bears. Um, since 1900, there's been roughly 61 killings by black bears. Um, only three of these involved mother bears, and none of these appear to be in defense of their cubs. However, uh, this is not the case for grizzly bears. So about 70% or more of grizzly bear killings are due by mothers protecting their cubs. And this is basically due to a difference in behavior um, and evolutionary adaptations. Black bears have typically evolved around trees, and so they're very arboreal, and black bears can have this flight response of getting up into a tree and away from threats, whereas grizzly bears didn't, so you are probably more likely to encounter this, uh, these attacks from a grizzly bear mother. And so this is important to know where you are and what species of bear that you may be encountering. And so the reality is that mother black bears rarely, if never, attack people in defense of their cubs. Um, what they will do, as we talked about earlier, is huff, puff, snort, uh, bluster, or they'll simply run away. Um, and what they won't do is try to eat you for dinner, um, we can hope. An approaching bear wishes to do me harm. And this was something that was kind of new to me in doing some of this research. Um, but that's not necessarily true. Um, bears are very inquisitive by nature and new objects or situations will frighten them and this is called a strange object response and after the initial fright they'll often investigate what spooked them and people will um, perceive this as an aggressive act which is not so it's simply um, a bear checking out what's going on so play dead during an attack we've seen this growing up a hundred times in cartoons and things of that nature and this is potentially untrue at least for black bears if you're attacked by a grizzly bear defending their cubs um, it can work however if attacked by a predatory bear such as a black bear the advice is to fight for your life don't play dead in this situation and this is a little image by the Cincinnati Zoo and it says the same thing essentially um, you know, scream, fight, kick, throw rocks, use sticks, um, anything you can. If the bear perceives you as not being worth the effort, it's a high likelihood that it'll just back off and run away. 
So now that I've hopefully alleviated some fears and given you a little bit of advice on what to do or how to handle these situations, where can you observe bears in North America? And so this is a little chart from high to low if you wanted to screenshot this or, or pause and write it down or whatever, take a picture. How can you get involved? There's a lot of professional organizations. We have the Black Bear Conservation Coalition. Uh, we have the Texas Black Bear Alliance. There's the Bear Trust International, and there's the North American Bear Center. And so I appreciate everybody taking the time to check this out. I hope you got a little bit out of this. Um, that's my contact information if you want to get in touch with me for any reason. And uh, thanks again.